Welcome back to Small Caps, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kerry Stevenson. Today, I'm speaking with Paul Locke. He's the Managing Director of Pan Asia Metals. ASX code is PAM. I've asked Paul to come on today because they've just come out with their mineral resource, resource estimate. But for those of you that don't know, Pan Asia Metals are, I think, the only lithium uh, company over in Southeast Asia. I'm sure Paul will correct me if I'm wrong. So it's pretty exciting. Big project, out with the mineral resource estimate. So lots to chat about today. Paul, thanks for coming back and joining me on Small Caps. Thanks for having me, Kerry. It's uh, good to be here. It is great to see you. And I, look, Paul, congratulations first, not just on the mineral resource estimate, which we'll get into in a moment, but all the work that you've been doing. There's been 18 months of drilling. It's delivering good results. And that's why I want our audience to understand today a little bit about the, what work has gone into this. But before we get into that, give us a brief overview on who are Pan-Asia Metals. Okay. So uh, just to let you know, I probably did most of that work. Um, but, uh, Pan <laughs> <laughs> on his own, ladies and gentlemen, no one else. <laughs> Pan-Asia Metals is a, um, so we're a, a, a battery and crit critical metals explorer. And um uh, we are the only explorer in Southeast Asia uh, with uh, licensed lithium projects. Um, there are one or two out there with applications, um, but um, uh, knowing the ground well, an application is a long way from a license. So we're effectively the only lithium explorer in Southeast Asia and um, actually uh, Asia, really, except China. Wow. So, so um, David Hobby and I, the chief geologist, and I have been working together uh, in Asia for a long time, over 10 years. And um, our objective has been to identify um, high value projects. We haven't just looked at battery and critical metals. Um, and we're focused on a particular belt, uh, which is called the Southeast Asian Tin Tungsten Belt, which um, flows through uh, Peninsula uh, Myanmar, Peninsula Thailand and then Peninsula uh, Malaysia. Uh, but we also look at other belts around there too. So we're, we're very comfortable with Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, uh, the Philippines um, and so on. So we have a good knowledge of the area and of project potential. Um, so the idea is ultimately to build a company with several uh, good projects. Well, you, you, uh, as I speak to you today, uh, there is a lot of talk about lots of companies in the lithium space and that maybe lithium has had its day. Um, I'd really love, before we get into the project itself, could you just give your views on uh, why you think that's happening and do you think that they're wrong? I mean, is there still going to be that supply-demand gap? Um, I think uh, if we look at history, I don't think the, the statement is correct. So when we look at the first lithium boom, which started in April 2016, and before that, there were three or four companies on the ASX with lithium projects, uh, Oracobra, uh, Galaxy, uh, even PLS wasn't right there right at the start. Um, and most people looked at lithium like it was clay, you know, it's just who cares. Uh, by September, October in 2016, I think we counted 70 lithium professionals on the ASX. Um, and then uh, uh, that, that phase passed and a lot of those guys disappeared and they literally disappeared, raised a lot of money. And those projects, most of those projects turned to nothing. And then in the last 12 months, we've seen exactly the same thing. Um, uh, a lot of the uh, incumbents, um, uh, they got the lifeblood they needed to, to continue with their projects and they've done really well. A good example is Core. So Core was there in the first round, then went dormant because there was just no money. And then look at it now, it's a, a two plus billion dollar company and they've broken ground. So fantastic outcome. Um, but there's still a lot of companies there and um, they've raised money on the word lithium, a few rock chips, et cetera, et cetera. But um, if history is any indicator, uh, which it is in a lot of minerals and a lot of booms, most of those projects will amount to nothing. And this is where investors have got to sort of try and 
um, sort out the rubbish commentary from what's reality. And, um, and I would say that 10% of the companies which are looking for lithium will be here in a year or two years. 10%. Um, All right. So yeah. before we get into your project, Paul, what, do you, what would you say to investors that they need to be cautious about when putting their hard-earned money? And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, not financial advice, but what Paul and I are talking about is the fact that there's a lot of companies out there using the word lithium and as always you must be very cautious but i'd love your views on what they it's, should be cautious about and sometimes well it's sometimes Kerry. it's extremely difficult to sort out what will get through and what won't um and it all comes down to geology and the reality is um there'll be some companies there which the surface expressions of what they're looking for look fantastic and it'll just come up um, as a duster and you'll see other companies which will just hit across something uh, which wasn't expected and it'll be an absolute, fa absolutely fantastic project. A really good example was Liontown. You might recall um, there was a bit of a, a Barney over that project and who had the rights to it. It was yeah. a gold project and the hanging wall was, um, was spodumene um, and no one really knew that um, until it was secured and it's turned out to be quite a large project. Um, so it's, it is very hard to tell what's what at the outset. Um, um, uh, I mean, when we look at projects, uh, uh, I mean, we've all started with rock chips and you've got to give people that. You've got to start somewhere. You can't write it off. Um, it's, in, it's incredibly hard, really, to say what's, what's going to be good and what's not. You can't say. Uh, but the reality is there will be a lot of um, a lot of uh, wreckage. <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah. Guess, I guess that's true. Um, you've got a lot of experience um, in, in this area. Uh, Paul, again, just going back to you and also to Pan Asia, what attracted you to this project? Because some people will be turning around saying, mm, jurisdiction, Thailand, not quite sure. I'd be really keen why you think that what you've got your hands on is going to go forward in the future and, and, and develop into um, a, a real project? Well, well, number one is you need to go to where the geology is. The project will never come to you. Um, <laughs> so um, you have to live with the jurisdiction you're in. Um, one of the reasons we're in Asia um, is that it's not too busy. Um, so we see a lot of things where if we were in Australia, um, it's just a busier environment. So it's, it's just harder to do a deal, et cetera. Um, we also understand Asia very well. So regardless of what jurisdiction you're in or if you're an investor, you need to be behind a management team who actually understand where they are. So if someone just pops up and says, we've found a project in Mali and we're going there, uh, well, that's fine. But um, how much experience has your team got there? And, um, and do they understand the lay of the ground? Because there's, uh, in every jurisdiction, there's nuances which you need to understand and just comes with time. Um, whenever people do talk about political risk, the first question I do ask them is, um, have they invested in Africa? Have they invested in South America? And typically they always have. <laughs> um, and then my next answer is, well, uh, not one company uh, of country in Africa has a free trade agreement with anyone. Um, and uh, not one country in South America, except Chile, has a free trade agreement with anyone. Where we are in Asia, most countries have FTAs because it's such a busy area. So in Southeast Asia or, or the ASEAN countries, which are 10 countries, the population is over 600 mil. And then you add India and China and it's nearly 3 billion. So wow. it's, a, it's a hugely busy area. And, um, and, and that's really important to understand. Uh, I mean, um, I might shoot myself in the foot, but people do raise Kingsgate from time to time. Yeah. You know, what happened to Kingsgate? Absolutely. But the reality is Kingsgate... Um, had recourse because they were in a country with a free trade agreement and they could go to arbitration and they were actually successful. So yeah. it created some problems, but that whole process also created protections. Um, uh, a government is going to be a lot more cautious about how it deals with a, 
a, a foreign company if there's an FTA mechanism there, whereas where, if there's not, um, they don't have to consider that. So they're really yeah. important objectives. Uh, that said, in South America and Africa, there's a lot of mining there um, uh, and, um, uh, you know, it, it, they're good jurisdictions. There's nothing wrong with them. But um, when it comes to political risk, um, it, it's up to you and your experience on how you manage that political risk. I really appreciate that. And I, and I hope our, our, our community out there takes a lot from that because I really appreciate your time on that one. Let's get into this latest announcement from Pan-Asia Metals, if we could, the mineral resource estimate. Just explain to us the importance of this in the development of this project and, and also what, what it is. That, give us an outline. Well, um, I think for, for any company, any exploration company, um, your inaugural mineral resource estimate um, legitimises the work that you've been doing. Um, and particularly now, as um, as Jork uh, uh, becomes more particular about what what is a resource, so you've got to be mm -hmm. uh, 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 you, you've got to have a better you've got to have a better resource in the ground, basically now. Um, so for any company, uh, it it basically puts a stake in the ground and says, you know, we we have something. It's actually been supported. So our Jork resource. Uh, report was done by CSA Global, so one of the best firms in the world. So it, it's a real, really solid resource. And our uh, poor David Hobby got put, put through the ringer on that. Um, but uh, it, it says that it's legitimate and, and it can really happen. So uh, if you look at a company and its, it's mineral resources um, based on the 2004 code or it's 10 years old or whatever, it might be a little bit looser, but for any company, it's a, it's a good milestone. For ours, um, uh, investors will see it's 10.4 million tonnes of 0.44% Li2O and with a number of credits in there. And the first question people ask is, well, that seems low, 0.44%. You know, when I look at Pilbara, it's 1.3%. If I look at ABZ, it's 1.6%, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you've got to treat the lithium markers and the spodumene a little bit differently. So okay. um, we can look at Lepidico. They've got a DFS. Their um, resource grades are uh, similar to ours, um, uh, but their DFS for lithium hydroxide uh, has them effectively at the bottom of the cost curve, uh, even though it's, it's a low grade. And the reason they've been able to achieve that is because of the uh, credits um, and we think. So, so sorry to interrupt you, Paul. When you say the credits, you're saying that the particular type of deposit you have, or they have as well, means that even though the 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 lithium might be a lower grade, you have a lot of other uh, product byproducts, if you like. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's right. There's um, well, in in our case, uh, the tin and tantalum should be recoverable at the concentrator stage, and because we're actually in a uh, in an area with a larger population, i.e. Thailand, um, we'll have uh, bulk uh, industrial products like feldspar and quartz, or effectively sand, which can be used in the cement industry. So if you look at Piedmont um, and look at their feasibility study, they actually uh, have feldspar, quartz and mica as byproducts to help reduce costs, and that's purely a function of their locality. Whereas if my project... But if, if I'm in the middle of WA, those products really can't be used. And then in the processing side, um, lipidolite typically has other chemicals, including uh, potassium, cesium and rubidium, um, uh, which um, help reduce the cost, particularly cesium and rubidium, which are both high value, high value products. But does it make the processing of the product more complex? Well, this is a really good question, and yes, it would do. Um, but if you look at the rare earth industry, uh, and and if you take a, a rare earth oxide, and it might have ten elements in it, and the grade of those elements are far far lower. I um, mean, you're talking PPMs, and um, uh, they they can still process it. I mean, the value of the rare earth is very high too, but so is lithium. Um, so it's more complex, but it's uh, nothing new. 
Uh, but in our feasibility, Kerry, uh, one of our considerations, well, we, we have six key considerations and they are uh, include the toxicity of our reagents, you know, um, what the byproducts credits are and reducing the process risk. So we're still to sort out whether we go down a pass uh, like acid leach or whether we do a sulfate roast, which is largely what's being used in China. And depending on what you use, it depends on what byproducts are accessible, et cetera. So um, it's, there's still a bit of water to flow under that bridge. So, so do it, does that come down to the ore sorting? Like, is it, so that's that's right at the start, is it? No, okay. that's further further down further the, the other chain. Yeah. So we mentioned in our MRE the ore sorting. So, um, a lot of uh, if we deliver a resource and it's uh, effectively one big giant fat pegmatite, um, then uh, we're basically mining the whole pegmatite. So um, uh, the the resource grade. Um, should sort of reflect the head grade in, in a, uh, a, a way, but so, so the reserve grade. Whereas if you're mining um, a, a dike vein swarm, like we are, we're, well, we're exploring a dike vein swarm, you've got a lot of fingers. Your pegmatites are like fingers. And in between the, your fingers, um, a lot of metasets, so low grade or zero grade product. So when you um, build your resource model, it's a block model, and it's based on a five by five by 10 metre, uh, well, um, uh, cube. Uh, it's not really a cube, is it? But um, I get what you're saying. It's a geometric shape of some sort. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, it's really crude because it captures a lot of this waste. So you naturally get a, um, a dilution in your grade because you've got more tons for the same amount of lithium content. And so um, working on that block model, we have a grade of 0.44%, uh, but we know that there's um, uh, a lot of low grade and waste in there because a lot of the mineralization is in the pegmatites. And so ore sorting is a way or a means to remove that waste before you put it into the uh, crusher to produce a concentrate. So well, you would expect an upgrade in your head grade um, before you start spending money on processing that material. And this is quite common. And ore sorting now is uh, very advanced and our pegmatites are white effectively and the country rock is black. So it's pretty easy for an optical sorter to sort out what's what. It's all black and white. Sorry. Exactly. That is. Black and white. We don't have a lot of time, but there's so much I want to ask you. Um, the sort of the value add that you guys do because it's 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 mining to concentrate, but then you're going to be doing some value add. Talk to us about that. What's really important? Uh, well, look um, from the from the get go, we've all, all always been about value add. So I'm a big believer in value adding, and sometimes this is doable, and sometimes it's not. And uh, a big chunk of it is your geography. So where we are in Southeast Asia. We've got big petrochemical industrial centres in Malaysia and Thailand, which basically sit, um, we sit between these. Uh, and um, that means that all of our chemicals or reagents are available or at hand. Um, we're in a low cost industrial environment. So producing chemicals in this region is normal. And this is why a lot of companies go there. For instance, there's a company called Redflow who produces vanadium batteries, uh, flow batteries. And they actually moved to Thailand because for cost environment, um, FYI. So uh, we're all about value adding. And what we're looking at um, in, uh, uh, with our project is to move downstream and produce a lithium chemical. So we're yet to work out whether that's lithium carbonate, phosphate or hydroxide. It might even be a combination of those two. And then um, with that, we may be in a position to leverage up uh, in this market where a lot of auto companies and so on are trying to put their foot on supply is to, is to uh, become involved in a cathode active um, material manufacturing, so CAM manufacturing. So if we can achieve that, I'm, I'm very happy, but we'll get to chemicals without a problem. I've got to ask you this question. Look, lots of people looking for supply. Have you, have you been inundated with people go, go reaching out saying, uh, how can we help you? What can we do? How can we make this process go a little bit faster? Uh, well, actually, um, I haven't because we haven't had a mineral resource. 
I think we're a bit early for those sorts of conversations. Um, uh, we, we have had some discussions, but clearly we're a bit early. Uh, I would expect um, uh, some of those discussions to happen now. Um, can, yeah. can, can you just explain to our audience as well the difference between lipidolite and spodumene? Is lipidolite easier to mine? Is it lower cost? Uh, when people are looking at lithium, not, not all lithium is made the same. Uh, yes. So just explain that lipidia, lipidolite versus spodumene. Well, the key, the key difference is uh, spodumene to, to crack the lithium, um, you need to roast it. Um, at around 1,100 degrees Celsius. So that's high cost. So th that's the key difference. So effectively, you could drop lipid light into acid and leach everything out, which is uh, what acid leach is, really. Um, uh, but you don't need to roast it for, uh, first. That, that is the key difference. Wow. And then even though the processing costs may be slightly higher, um, the uh, byproducts help reduce that overall cost. So they're the two key differences. Well, and you know what? When you talk roasting, and we're talking about an energy crisis at the moment, and prices going up, wh what a good thing that you've got lipidolite. We are running out of time. Um, one last thing that I wanted to ask you: um, What's the next news? What's the news flow that's going to be coming uh, for you? What's next after this mineral resource estimate? Okay, well, um, in our release today, um, we advised that the mineral resource estimate was based on holes 1 to 46, we're on hole 72, with another 20 or so planned. So um, those holes will be finished over the next two or three months, and we'll have a mineral resource update uh, later this year. So given that uh, that mineral resource update will capture uh, 95 to 100 holes, and we're at hole 46, um, we, we could naturally expect that there's going to be a tonne upgrade, um, uh, which is good news, uh, and I'm not sure about grade, maybe. Um, we've, so we've got a lot of those drilling announcements to come through. We're doing our MET test work at the moment, um, and that will all feed into a scoping study, which um, we expect to deliver later this year too. So that's really the news flow. Um, we'll be moving our drilling rigs um, from Reonket to Bangi Tum once we finish this drilling. And that's uh, another prospect. We did some initial investigative uh, drilling there um, in early last year. Uh, one fence of three holes uh, was across a pegmatite dike swarm of 100 metres wide with some pretty nice grades in there, 10 metres at uh, nearly a percent. So that's really look good looking stuff. So yeah. we'll be adding that into the mineral resource. All right, so lots of news flow coming up. So you better come back uh, when we get some more of those uh, results uh, out, Paul. Um, but for now, what I would really like to do um, is tell our audience, if you will, um, three reasons. I always say only three. You've probably got 25, but only three that you think now is a good time for them to sit up and take notice of PAM. Well, <laughs> Carrie, it's very hard to uh, bring it to three points, but I'm going to give it my oh, best. Oh, Paul, best give it your best shot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, point number one, um, uh, now that we've delivered a mineral resource estimate, we're a lot further ahead of many of our uh, exploration peers. Um, okay. So uh, that's, a, that's a really good outcome for the company. We're pretty happy about that. Point number two, uh, as discussed, lipidolite has distinct cost advantages over other sources of lithium due to the byproducts in it and uh, the uh, lower costs or, or no requirement to roast. So this is going to add to the revenue line and this additional revenue will naturally flow through to the bottom line. And then point number three, uh, we can see globally there's uh, supply, supply chain issues everywhere, so they're not going away. Uh, we're one of the few uh, project owners uh, which are situated incredibly close to the uh, LIB and EV manufacturers. So our location means that we are on the doorstep of not one, but several major customers and a lot of minor customers. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity for us to strike uh, good and interesting deals with some of these players. They'll be biting your hand off as you get further down the line if you're that close to them because... Do you know what, Paul? I really think supply chain issues are not going away. And if you're close to these manufacturers, as I say, they're going to be biting your hand off in the in the months and years to come. But 
Really appreciate um, you that, that overview at the start as well. And ladies and gentlemen, there's a fantastic presentation that Pan Asia Medals and Paul, on his own, of course, have put together. It's on the website. Go to panasiametals.com. I would urge you to, to literally download. There's a lot of information um, on there. And the thing that I like, and I really, really um, want to finish off with this, is, um, you know, one of the things that Pan Asia Metals says is that they're exploring for metals that make a difference in the world. So battery critical metals, but they want to make a difference in the world. Paul Locke, thank you so much for joining me and small caps. Thanks, Kerry. It's been really great. Again, thank you very much.